personally i met him uh, maybe in year of 2005 uh, um, or 6 and with his uh, uh, talk they are in iit kharagpur so i could solve a problem with what i stuck at, at that time due to my phd so with this uh, that memory still fresh with me anyway with that i will uh, welcome again uh, professor varishya to uh, national institute of technology raurkela uh, in this uh, lecture which is jointly organized by the department and also by the indian institute of metal raurkela student chapter now i request professor varishya to start his talk on the topic he proposed uh, theory based design of magnetic steel sir please let me just share my screen so um first of all uh, i would like to thank uh, both uh, professor patra and dr basu for arranging this and in particular the student chapter of the national institute of technology rukala for inviting me to give this talk it's always a pleasure for me to talk to students now uh, a lot of the material that i'm going to uh, talk about today uh, is available on my website here and there is a lot more about bainite and many other things on this website this is freely available so please feel free to have a look at that and uh, download as you wish now bainite why why is uh, bainite important uh, because after all we have martensitic steels which are very nice and strong and tough and you can control their properties just by uh, uh, heat treatment well uh, when you want to make very large objects for example the, this is a, a rotor of a steam turbine and it's it's much longer in this direction than the photograph shows but you can see that it's a huge size now in order to obtain the optimum properties there is no way that you can quench this material uh, such a large object in order to get a martensitic structure uh, you have to generate the right structure by continuous cooling and bainite can form uh, at relatively uh, slow cooling rates which is why you know for example uh, the steam rotor is made from 2 and a quarter chrome one moly steel which transforms through the section into a bainitic microstructure so the advantage of bainite is that you do not need to rapidly cool Uh, you don't set up stress gradients in your large component and you get a relatively uniform microstructure in in your whole component so let me now uh, briefly explain to you the microstructure that we call bainite and you know it is sufficiently fine that you can't really resolve it using optical microscopy because uh, schematically it it looks like this So look at this scale here is 0.2 micrometers which is uh, a typical thickness of a bainite plate uh, and that is below the wavelength of light so you cannot resolve this kind of a structure using optical microscopy you have to either use scanning electron microscopy or transmission electron microscopy and there are two two kinds of traditionally there are two kinds of bainite that we talk about the upper bainite which forms at relatively high temperatures and uh, has the cementite platelets between the ferrite platelets and the lower bainite which has thinner cementite between the plates and very fine uh, precipitation of carbides inside the plates now this forms at a lower temperature so the microstructural scale is finer than upper bainite so even though it is stronger than upper bainite it is actually tougher than upper bainite because the cementite is finer so we need to understand you know how do these microstructures form in order to be able to do a calculation which enables us to design a steel uh, first of all uh, this is just a schematic diagram so i'll show you the real microstructures and here is a transmission electron micrograph 
of upper bainite. Again, look at this scale. Each plate is of the order of 0.2 of a micrometer thick. And in between the plates, you have these residual phases, which may be cementite or austenite. And in contrast, lower bainite has thinner regions between the plates and these particles inside the plates. So essentially, the difference between upper and lower bainite is that uh, you get finer cementite precipitates. OK, let's have a look at how you can change the crystal structure of austenite into that of ferrite. So these are the unit cells of austenite here, gamma, uh, face-centered cubic cell with atoms at the corners and at the center of each face. And then we have the body-centered cubic structure of uh, bainite, and this can be slightly tetragonal. Uh, I'm going to ignore that uh, complexity. Uh, so here we have uh, an iron atom at, in the middle and iron atoms at the corner. And the question really is, uh, uh, bainite forms at low temperatures where the diffusion of iron atoms isn't really possible. So how can we get a change from this kind of a crystal structure into this without breaking the bonds? In other words, without any diffusion. And that's uh, quite an interesting uh, a problem, and it has a major effect on the microstructure that we get. So I'm going to show you a little movie about the mechanism by which you can change the parent structure into that of the product without breaking any bonds. So uh, imagine that uh, we have a lattice of atoms here. And uh, we have two kinds of atoms, the red atoms and the white atoms, and the crystal structure is defined by this unit cell. Now, I want to transform this without breaking any bonds, and I can do that by a physical deformation, which changes the pattern in which the atoms are arranged, uh, but the chemical composition is unchanged as a consequence. Uh, so, notice that in order to get a change from a square to an oblique cell, uh, there will be a physical deformation. Uh, this is a, a shear deformation here, but you also have a slight volume change normal to this interface. And furthermore, with a mechanism like this, all the near neighbor atoms retain their neighbors. So although there are slight changes here, uh, they all retain their nearest neighbors because there is no diffusion involved. So this is what we call a displacive transformation where you can change the crystal structure without breaking any bonds. But the consequence of it is that you get a shape deformation. That means if you're looking at the crystal while it's transforming, then you'll be able to see that there is a change in shape. And that causes a lot of strain energy. And that is the reason why we get the bainite in the form of very thin plates. Uh, now, this is the uh, corresponding case. Um, sorry, yeah. This is a, a movie showing the real change that we can observe when bainite forms from austenite. So here you can see uh, equiaxed grains of austenite, uh, if you look carefully. And when it transforms into bainite, the most important feature that you see is that the surface changes completely. Okay, so. These are physical deformations caused by the formation of bainite as the temperature is reduced. So this has a very large consequence on the shape of the transformation product, which is in the form of very thin plates. So it's a natural mechanism of grain refinement that is inherent to the transformation mechanism. We don't have to do any work to get the grain size effectively down to 0 0.2 micrometers. OK, uh, so let's see how bainite evolves as a function of time. Uh, obviously, it's a displacive transformation, so we do not involve diffusion. So imagine that you had a plate forming without any diffusion. So that's exactly like martensite. And martensite will also cause a change in the shape of uh, the uh, crystal when it forms. But bainite is forming at a relatively high temperature. So the carbon excess here tends to partition into the remaining austenite. 
And with upper bainite, it stays in that austenite. In lower bainite, because we are at a lower temperature, you also get precipitation inside the plate and less diffusion into the surrounding austenite. So we get a finer cementite precipitates between the plates and also some precipitates inside the plates. Whereas with upper bainite, we have these coarse cementite particles, which really are not good for toughness. Okay, This is why uh, lower bainite is stronger than upper bainite, even though uh, is tougher than upper bainite, even though it is stronger than upper bainite. Generally speaking, you know, the toughness goes down as you increase strength, but this contradicts that principle because of the brittleness of coarse cementite particles. So you should think of bainite as a diffusion-less transformation uh, with the plate forming with exactly the same chemical composition as the austenite. But during the course of transformation, it effectively tempers itself so that the carbon is able to escape into the surrounding austenite or precipitate uh, as cementite within the plates and between the plates from the austenite. Okay? So there's nothing more complicated about the mechanism of transformation than this diagram illustrates. So the time taken for the carbon to diffuse out of the plate of bainite is actually quite small. You know, it's of the order of seconds. And this is the reason why it said that it tempers during the course of transformation. And one major consequence which I really want you to understand and which helps us to design steels is that the reaction will stop before it reaches equilibrium. So this is a diagram showing the free energy of ferrite and the free energy of austenite at a particular temperature. OK, so this this slide is really crucial. OK, so um, I will repeat my explanation. Uh, this is the free energy curve of Austin, uh, ferrite and of austenite at a particular temperature. And the equilibrium composition of austenite and of ferrite is given by drawing this common tangent, which touches both of these curves. And that gives us our equilibrium phase diagram, the A1 phase boundary and the A3 phase boundary. But bainite is not an equilibrium transformation. Uh, it involves uh, an initial formation of a plate without any diffusion. And that can only happen if the austenite is has a composition to the left of this point where austenite and ferrite of the same composition have the same free energy. Because if the austenite has this composition, it can reduce free energy without a change in composition. But on this side, it's impossible because look, I will have to increase the free energy in order to transform into ferrite of the same composition, and that is not thermodynamically favored. Uh, or, or spontaneous, you cannot get that spontaneously. So this point here, if I plot the locus of this point as a function of temperature, then I get a curve which is called the T0 curve. And it's not normally plotted on equilibrium phase diagrams because it doesn't represent equilibrium. It simply represents the locus of points where austenite and ferrite have the same chemical composition uh, as a function of temperature. What it means is that austenite of composition to the right of the T0 curve cannot even in principle transform into ferrite of the same chemical composition. In other words, diffusion-less transformation is impossible. Okay, But if your austenite has a composition less than T0, then in principle it can transform into ferrite of exactly the same composition, so we can get diffusion-less transformation. Now, the T0 curve uh, can be calculated by hand. There's a, uh, there's a description given in my book on steels, but you can also download a computer program uh, from my website, which allows you to calculate the T0 curve as a function of many different elements like carbon, manganese, silicon, nickel, moly, chrome, vanadium, because these are the sort of alloying elements that we normally add to steels. So this is the only part of the design calculation that you need uh, to 
learn about, either from the book or using this computer program or any computer program like Thermocalc or Empty Data or MatCalc will allow you to do this calculation. So just to repeat, the importance of the T0 curve is that the Bainite reaction cannot continue beyond, uh, beyond the point T0. OK, so uh, imagine that we have an alloy with this carbon concentration X bar, and we are transforming it isothermally at this temperature. Then the first plate of Bainite will form without any diffusion, exactly like martensite. But because we are at a high temperature, the carbon will partition into the remaining austenite. So the next plate has to form from carbon enriched austenite, and then it too partitions carbon. And the third plate is forming from even more enriched austenite, and it partitions carbon. And beyond this point, you cannot get any bainite transformation. Okay? So this is a really important point, which we will use in designing really nice steels. So the T0 curve is the point where the bainite reaction will stop, and the composition of the austenite that remains will be defined by this T0 boundary. Obviously, if I go to a lower temperature, I can form more plates of bainite, and at a higher temperature, I, can, uh, I will get less bainite. And this is the equilibrium phase boundary. Okay, now uh, let's see what would happen if the transformation, um, if you do an experiment where we allow the transformation to proceed until it stops and we measure the carbon concentration of the austenite at the point at which the reaction stops. Well, experimentally, we find that it fits the T0 line. The T0 dashed is simply allowing for strain energy. And the composition at which the transformation stops is far away from what you expect from the equilibrium phase diagram. Okay? So basically, uh, you can argue uh, logically that this diagram represents how bainite forms, that you initially get a plate which is supersaturated with carbon, but because the temperature is such that you can get interstitial atom diffusion, uh, you get the partitioning of carbon. So this event is rapid, and this event takes of the order of a second. And with upper bainite, this partitioning of carbon is rapid compared with lower bainite. So here you also get some precipitation inside the plate and less partitioning of carbon. And that explains the classical microstructures that we get from upper bainite and lower bainite. Now, I said to you that having these coarse cementite particles is a bad thing, okay? Uh, that in a strong steel, you know, cementite acts like uh, uh, an inclusion which initiates uh, cracks or voids. And, you know, if you look at the structure here uh, of uh, upper bainite, you've got these lots and lots of these carbides, uh, which, you know, at, at low temperatures would crack by cleavage and at high temperatures would initiate the formation of voids and therefore reduce ductility. And you can demonstrate this, you know, if you stop the carbides from forming, then you greatly improve the toughness. Okay, so let me go into this in more detail. What I want to do is I want to stop the reaction here. Okay, uh, I don't mind the carbon partitioning into the austenite, because that will allow the austenite to be retained, and austenite is a good thing for toughness. Uh, but I do not want cementite precipitation. So if you go back more than 100 years, uh, you know that in cast ions, when you have a large silicon concentration, you favor the formation of graphite rather than cementite. And the reason is that the cementite lattice, which is illustrated here, does not like to have silicon. Okay, so here are some calculations. This is the um, uh, energy of formation at zero Kelvin of cementite. If I substitute silicon into a particular site inside this cell, that energy actually drastically in increases. That means you make your structure less stable. And similarly, at another uh, symmetry, 
if I substitute silicon for iron, uh, I get a large increase relative to cementite. So to put it simply, cementite hates silicon. So if you add roughly one weight percent of silicon to your steel, then you will stop the reaction at this point and you end up with a structure which is should have really good properties. It should be very thin platelets of ferrite, which are uh, roughly 0 0.2 micrometers thick, you know, a very fine grain size, and carbon enriched retained austenite, which has many benefits, which I'll explain later. So let's uh, let's make a steel, all right, without uh, without doing any calculations. Uh, iron 0 0.4 carbon, add some manganese for hardenability because I want to avoid the formation of high temperature transformation products, and add silicon to suppress cementite. There's nothing complicated about this uh, steel. And sure enough, when you transform it isothermally, you get this beautiful structure. This is one micrometer in size. So the plates are about 0 0.2 micrometers in thickness. And in between the plates, we have the carbon enriched austenite, not cementite, because we have our two weight percent of silicon in the steel. So ideally, uh, this, is, uh, this is the perfect structure to have for a combination of strength and toughness because you know that when you refine the grain size, you get an increase in strength and you know that austenite does not have a ductile brittle transition temperature. So it will remain tough even at low temperatures. So we have a fine structure, which is a direct consequence of the mechanism of transformation. Uh, we have retained austenite uh, and we are using, you know, one of the cheapest uh, elements to stabilize the austenite, that is carbon. So even though the average carbon concentration in the steel is 0 0.4 weight percent, the austenite will end up with something like 1.2 weight percent of carbon because that's the T0 concentration. Uh, and austenite is beneficial because it undergoes uh, transformation-induced plasticity when you apply uh, stress. So it tends to relieve any stress concentrations. It does not have a ductile brittle transition temperature like ferrite does. And, uh, you know, if you are worried about hydrogen embrittlement, then it also forms a barrier to hydrogen diffusion because the diffusion coefficient of hydrogen in austenite is far smaller than in ferrite. We don't have uh, the brittle cementite particles anymore, which is a very good thing. And we are left with a very small concentration of carbon in the ferrite. Ferrite is incredibly strengthened by carbon. So if you have too much carbon in there, then it will be brittle. So we have a whole set of uh, principles here, which say that our beautiful microstructure in the simple alloy should be strong and tough. So let's see what happens, okay? So we made the material, and here it is, the plot of Charpy toughness versus temperature. And you can see that this is a very, this has a very poor toughness, okay? Completely contradicting everything what I said previously. You know, the impact transition temperature is well above room temperature. What you want is really this to be at around minus 100 degrees centigrade. So something is wrong with our idea, okay? Our theory, if you like. Something has gone badly wrong, which is giving us extremely poor toughness. It is very strong, but you know, strength is of no use without uh, toughness. Now, when you look at the optical microstructure of this uh, steel, which is isothermally transformed, uh, you see, uh, a typical bainitic microstructure. These are our bainite plates. You can't resolve the individual plates, of course, uh, because look at the scale here. Individual plates within this cluster of plates would be about 0 0.2 micrometers in thickness. But the thing to notice is that we have large areas of untransformed austenite. Okay. Now, it's very good to have austenite films between the plates, but these very large regions of austenite as soon as you apply a stress, they decompose uh, into high carbon, untempered martensite. 
And look at the size of these regions. There's about 50 micrometers. So that's like designing a beautiful structure and then throwing a brick into it, which is 50 micrometers in size. And this is the reason why it is extremely uh, brittle. Now, there is nothing you can do about this because even if I hold the material at the isothermal transformation temperature for a very long time, once the austenite has reached a T0 composition, there will be no further bainite forming. So these islands of austenite, which are causing the problem, will remain there. Okay. So let's see whether our theory tells us something else to try. So going back to our T0 curve here, our goal is to increase the volume fraction of bainite so that the islands of austenite become smaller and smaller. So this is the volume fraction of bainite. This is the T0 curve. And the uh, ferrite carbon concentration will be very small. This is the average concentration in our ala. And a, at a particular temperature, this is the concentration defined by the T0 curve. So just by using the lever rule, this distance divided by this distance gives me the volume fraction of bainite. In other words, xt0 minus x bar, which is this distance, uh, this, this here, divided by xt0 minus x alpha gives me the volume fraction of bainite. And I cannot get more bainite than defined by this equation, which comes from our mechanism of transmission. So we are, it seems that we are stuck, okay? This concentration is almost zero, so you could ignore it for the moment. Um, and normally when I'm giving a lecture, I ask the students, you know, just looking at this equation, is there anything we can do to increase the volume fraction of bainite? And there are, there are three things, three answers. Now, obviously this, uh, I can't interact with the audience uh, today, but, you know, if you decrease the average carbon concentration, then this will increase. And we don't compromise the strength because the strength comes from the very fine bainite plate. So decreasing X bar would do it. Can I increase XT0? Well, if I choose my substitutional alloying element so that the thermodynamics of austenite and ferrite are modified, I may be able to increase XT0. So that's a second option. And the third option is to reduce the transformation temperature. But there's a limit to that because uh, we want to avoid martensite. So let's see from this simple equation, without doing any experiments, can we design a better steel? Okay, so it's a very, very simple equation. This is just an application of the lever rule, this distance divided by this distance, uh, in order to calculate the maximum amount of bainitic ferrite that we can get at a particular temperature. Right, so this was our original steel. I'm going to reduce X bar. In other words, make this concentration half its original value in order to allow more bainite to form because if you reduce the average concentration, then the carbon partitioned into the austenite is less and therefore, you can form more bainite before the T0 condition is reached. Everything else is identical here, okay? And if I substitute manganese with nickel, keeping the carbon concentration here the same, then I can shift the T0 curve to higher carbon concentrations. So that's illustrated here, that you know uh, nickel shifts the T0 curve to higher carbon concentrations. So without doing any experiments, uh, the prediction is that if I make these two steels, one with the carbon concentration and in the other shifting the T0 curve, then I should recover the nice toughness that I was talking about earlier. So let's see what happens, okay? So first of all, the structures of the two steels are exactly as I would expect. These are Transmission electron microwaves, bright field electron microwaves showing our plates about 0.2 of a micrometer in thickness. And these are the dark field images of the retained austenite. 
and the large islands of austenite have disappeared because we've got more bainitic ferrite. And sure enough, you know, when you measure the toughness, there is a change in the impact transition temperature by minus 200 degrees centigrade for both of these steels. You can see uh, uh, this is the high carbon steel, but with the T0 curve moved to higher carbon concentrations, and we've got really good toughness at low temperatures. And this is the X bar being reduced from 0.4 to 0.2, very simple calculation, you have dramatically improved the toughness of the steel. And the strength, I emphasize that the strength is not compromised. In other words, we get the same strength in all three, about 1600 megapascals, without, uh, uh, without compromising the toughness. So what I want to emphasize is that going from the mechanism of transformation, understanding from an optical micrograph that you have large islands of austenite, which will decompose to martensite under stress and therefore make your material brittle, and then using the simple T0 analysis, without doing any experiments, predict two alloys which should behave much better, and they do in practice. So let's uh, let's now think about applying this to a real uh, component. So these are sections of rail steels, uh, large and small sections, and traditionally they are made from perlite. Okay, and normally we are taught that perlite uh, consists of alternating lamellae of cementite and ferrite and that when you refine the interlamellar spacing, you get an increase in strength. However, you do not get an increase in toughness. And the reason is that this is not actually the real structure. In three dimensions, all of these cementite lamellae are connected and represent a single crystal, and the ferrite in between is also connected in three dimensions, to represent another single crystal. So it's it's uh, interpenetrating single crystals of cementite and ferrite. It's only when you section them that you see a lamellar structure. So imagine that you have a cabbage and the cabbage represents cementite. All the leaves are connected. So that's a single crystal of cementite. And then you have a bucket of water and the water is the ferrite and all of the ferrite is a single crystal. So when I put this cabbage inside water, that represents perlite. And if I section that, then I will see what appears as if it's a lamellar structure. So given that this whole thing is a bicrystal and cementite is a brittle phase, the toughness is not determined by the interlamellar spacing, but by the size of the perlite colony. So when you increase the strength by decreasing the interlamellar spacing, you don't improve the toughness unless the colony size is also reduced. So traditional politic rail steels are not as tough as you would like them to be. So we want to design a rail steel now using the carbide-free bainitic steel. And what, uh, whenever you think about design, you think about what are the most important properties that you need for the application and can you actually manufacture the material in large quantities at a reasonable price and so on. So material science is plagued with claims about new materials, but they all fall by the side after a few years because people focus on individual properties, not looking at the component and not thinking about what happens when you scale your material up. Okay, so we want to design something that can be manufactured on large scale reasonably cheaply, and rails is a good example. And the two key properties that you need for a rail are rolling contact fatigue resistance, because every time a wheel goes on the surface of a rail, it induces a pulse of stress underneath, and that stress is a cyclic stress, uh, which eventually leads to fatigue failure. And of course, you know, you've got metal rolling on metal and it's not perfect rolling contact. 
it, uh, it's also not uh, lubricated, so you need your material to have a wear resistance. Now, just to illustrate uh, rolling contact, you know, if you put a sphere on top of a surface here, and you press from the top uh, with a pressure P naught, then the maximum stresses are induced under the surface of the steel. Okay, under the surface, not at the contact point. And those, uh, each time your rolling element goes over that point, it will induce a pulse of stress, and those cyclic stresses initiate fracture under the surface, which eventually works its way to the top of the surface, and you get material flaking off. And that is not a good thing. Uh, so the nature of the stress is quite complicated because it's not just uh, application of load vertically, but you should think about it as a compression and a torsion happening together. Happening together. So how do we test for this uh, in in the laboratory? Well, uh, you you have uh, special equipment in which you make a wheel out of your rail material, and then you rotate it against another wheel, which is made from standard material, and they are going at different speeds. Okay, so there is a certain amount of slippage, and there is also pressure applied from the top. So this is a laboratory type test with which we can determine how good your material is in rolling contact fatigue. And this is a typical sample that we use. Now, when you do that, uh, it gives you an indication that your steel is good or, or not good or compare how it compares with standard materials. But ultimately, you must do a full scale test. So the data I'm going to show you next come from full scale tests of wheels on rails. Much more expensive tests. OK, so this is your normal politic steel. And I'm showing you the killer cycles to crack initiation due to rolling contact fatigue. This is a Martin City rail, and this is a new uh, carbide free bayonetic rail uh, where we stop, stop the test after a while because it's really quite expensive. And uh, something like a rail is safety critical. So people are not going to accept it unless uh, there has been experience in service. So in the USA, there is a, a test track where you can you can run heavy goods trails, uh, rails, uh, uh, rail cars over your experimental rail. And this is the carbide free bayonetic rail. And this is conventional rail. And this is after 90 million gross tons of traffic on a curve. And you can see that this is performing much better than the normal rail, where you can already see quite a lot of uh, uh, rolling contact fatigue damage. So this is very resistant to rolling contact fatigue. Uh, and one of the reasons why it also has a very good wear rate is that there are no hard particles inside the carbide free magnetic rail. So you don't get bits of material, uh, tiny bits of material, coming off uh, when a, a, a wheel passes over the rail. So in terms of wear rate, it also outperforms any conventional material. So you have to think about the wear on the wheel and the rail as well, because you know if you design a rail which has uh, zero wear but causes a lot of wear on the wheel, then people are not going to be happy. OK, so uh, the rail was manufactured uh, and installed in the Channel Tunnel, which is the tunnel that connects uh, uh, the UK to France. Okay, uh, and uh, this is a real picture of the carbide free bayonetic rail in the Channel Tunnel. And in November 2019, it had done 1 billion gross tons of traffic. Uh, and in April 2020, it had done that many gross tons of traffic without developing fatigue or a need for grinding. So this is the bayonetic rail steel, and this is the uh, uh, conventional steel. So I, I should really end the story here, but there is a huge amount of potential 
in using the actual atomic mechanism of transformation in order to design a novel steel. And I'm not going to go into any detail, but some years ago, we made the world's first bulk nanostructured material where the bayonetic plates are finer than carbon nanotubes at the same magnification. So these are plates in three dimensions, they're not tubes. And again, we have the mixture of carbide free uh, uh, ferrite and carbon enriched retained austenite. So here the strength is much greater than two gigapascals. And one of the first applications of this is in bearings, large bearings, okay? So the rolling elements that you see here, you know, so normally we think of them as balls, but they can also be cylinders in shape, are made from this so-called uh, super bainite. Now, I want to leave time for questions. So if you have a, a real interest in this, you can download all of these books from my website completely free of charge. This is the third edition, second edition, first edition, and you can even have a Chinese language edition. So I'll end the talk here and um, look forward to some discussion. Thank you. So I'll stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Yes, the session is now open for discussion. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you for the talk. I wanted to ask uh, whether there have been any uh, modeling and simulation based uh, attempt to uh, disk, uh, predict or uh, correlate with the experimental findings which you have shown in this uh, presentation. Yes, uh, there, there's a huge amount of uh, work actually. Um, you know, and the work is focused on several aspects. Uh, so one is that you know if you think about the transformation as a deformation because it it really does change the shape of the parent crystal. Then when you get transformation under stress, you will get some, some, some orientations of plates favored compared with others. So you develop a crystallographic texture and that has been analyzed rigorously. Uh, there's a lot of work on the composition of the austenite at the point where the reaction stops and a lot of direct observations of bainite actually growing and comparing it with what we expect from theory. So all that is described in uh, my book, which you can download freely from my website. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. I, I can't. You just need to unmute. So, uh, Sitaram, uh, you need to unmute. Thank you. Uh, this is where we require a teacher. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we, we have followed wonderfully your uh, publications on residual stress. Actually, the way you indicate the habit planes. I have used the term very successfully, but still in India, especially for mechanical engineers who get into this kind of development, they require much more, you know, polished education. The carbide free bionetic steels are not well understood by mechanical engineers. Metallurgists, they know about it. But when we implement that in the field, as you, sir, as you rightly pointed out, whatever we observe in the lab, we will not be able to replicate that in the field. So I, I worked in Power Research Institute for the power industry. So we, 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 we have optimized to some extent the retained austenite as well as the habit plane concept, but not to the extent we wanted that to become, you know, useful. Possibly 
one of these days we would like you to address in one of the memorial talks on the residual stress and your books i have recommended always earlier possibly long ago two decades ago i have met you at cambridge along with hutchings professor hutchings i think possibly you may or may not remember because it was a very 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 short meeting sure. that's right because uh, he and hutchings uh, left our department to go yes. to the engineering department uh, uh, maybe 20 years ago yes 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 so so we would like to stay in touch with you please educate our mechanical engineers more and more okay i will do my best okay, okay. thank you sir hello uh, yes sir uh, so uh, this is arpita here so it was really a nice talk we got to know many things about the benai transformation so i have a uh, one doubt that uh, while benai transformation in case of upper benai uh, uh, in order to uh, avoid the cementite and uh, for that as you have mentioned that in order to increase the t not curve uh, so we are the like for example you have shown that um, we have substituted ma uh, nickel in place of manganese so my doubt is how to choose elements that uh, that will increase our uh, t not curve so that will lead to the more toughness yeah yeah so that's a very good question and um, so uh, i mentioned that there are two ways in which you can calculate the t0 curve as a function of all the alloying elements and one of those methods which you can just do using a calculator to see which elements will shift the t0 curve to higher concentrations is in my uh, book on steels uh, so it's it's here and you know this book is meant for undergraduates so this at the in the last chapter there is a method uh, by which you can calculate the t0 curve as a function of the alloying elements uh using a calculator on the other hand uh, there's also a very simple fortran program on my website for which i gave a, a link you can download a computer program and uh, compile it and it you can calculate the t0 curve as function of carbon manganese silicon nickel moly chrome vanadium uh, in in reasonable concentrations so that is how you would do it Does that okay. answer your question, uh, uh, Arpita? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. I got it, sir. And I'll follow Fortran program and I'll try uh, surely, sir. And another question is: Is there any rule like uh, whatever the elements we have taken, uh, they are mainly uh, like ferrite stabilizers and austenite stabilizer? Is there any rule of uh, those in case of Benai transformation, sir? Uh, yes, for that, sir. I want to know. Yes. So. Um, Now remember that ferrite stabilizer and austenite stabilizer is a rough, rough description. So what I'm going to say doesn't always apply. But in general, uh, something that stabilizes ferrite, uh, in other words, it increases the free energy difference between austenite and ferrite, will tend to move the T0 curve to higher concentrations. Now you can immediately say that. Ah, but nickel stabilizes austenite. However, remember that we were comparing manganese and nickel. Okay, we we are not uh, saying, um, you know, if you sub manganese is a much stronger stabilizer of austenite than nickel, and that is the reason why nickel shifted it to a higher concentration. But if you compare with uh, aluminium addition, uh, nickel. Uh, it performs better than nickel in shifting the T0 curve to a higher concentration because aluminium is a ferrite stabilizer but it's a rough way of thinking because uh, for example chromium uh, does not uh, stabilize austenite you can uh, add sufficient chromium so the austenite completely disappears but at the same time it reduces the martensite start temperature so the best way to think about is in terms of the difference in free energy between austenite and ferrite if that difference can be increased then the t0 curve will move to a higher carbon concentration
ओके सर थैंक यू सो मच सर ओके सर दिस इज अ प्रोफेसर पत्रा yeah so i have, I have a uh, query that uh, benetic steel is now becoming a very highly uh, prosperous in terms of high speed uh, train tracks so how prospective the benetic steel as far as the uh, bullet trains are concerned the tracks of uh, bullet trains are concerned how what is the prospect of uh, uh, if you can uh, put some light on that so you know this is a, uh, actually a very complex question uh, thank you very much for that um So I have a colleague, uh, Jay Jaiswal, who has a lot of experience uh, in industry and uh, in the rail industry. And you know, the sort of things that you need to consider uh, also is what sort of track are you interested in? Does it involve a curve? What is the radius of the curve, and so on? So the carbon-free magnetic rail doesn't perform too well on. a uh, uh, highly curved section of the rail so there you have to use um, uh, politic rails or or other other variants so there there's a huge variety actually of commercially available rail steels for different kinds of uh, scenarios on the route itself and i don't think that there is any high speed rail uh, to my knowledge which uses the carbide free benetic rail because the problem there is different from just ensuring uh, rolling contact fatigue resistance it's also the wear on the head and so on which is not good if you use the benetic uh, carbide free benetic rail thank you sir okay uh, students uh, you can ask questions Uh, faculties are uh, participant from outside students uh, can ask questions now it is open for discussion uh, sir uh, I, i have one query that uh, we are telling uh, carbon free uh, benetic steel so uh, and we also know the concept of for low car very low carbon um, steel that uh, acicular ferrite right. so how you um, put these two concept together yeah so um the term acicular ferrite um is used in two ways all right uh, one is in welding welding alloys and uh, in welding alloys you know the fact that the plates the plates of bainite form on non metallic inclusions and therefore they form a very interweaved structure which improves toughness but in low carbon road uh, to sort of steels you produce in hundreds of millions of tons uh, the acicular ferrite is basically bainite it's no different from it but uh, by the time you come to observe it many of these uh, because of the low carbon concentration they are touching and the morphology looks a little bit confused but if you stopped the transformation at an early stage you would see exactly those plates of bainite that i was showing you So, a cyclic ferrite in low carbon uh, steels is the same as bainite. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sir, I would like to ask a question. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, we have uh, uh, triplated bainitic steels, and uh, sometimes we go above A3, and then we quench it to the bainitic bay and uh, uh, astemper it. Mm -hmm. then again we also have a quench partition now what is the uh, transmission how how do we apply the t0 concept in all this yeah so uh, the t0 concept uh, only defines the point where the reaction stops okay the uh, reaction stops but if you then do a quench and partitioning uh, treatment then any carbon that's left in the benetic ferrite Uh, will also tend to partition further but there will be no more transformation okay 
So you can get more partitioning from the ferrite into the austenite, but there cannot be more transformation to bainite. Yeah. Now, in the case of martensite, uh, the quencher, traditional quench and partitioning, if you like, uh, you've got supersaturated plates, partially transformed, and you raise the temperature so that the carbon from the martensite can go into the residual austenite. So it's kind of like, uh, like the bainite transformation. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, uh, again, we have the uh, ferrite bainitic grades where we are having lower silicon contents. And there also bainitic transformation take place, but uh, it is not with retained austenite, am I right? Yeah, so if you, if you don't have uh, sufficient silicon or aluminum, yes. those are two, two key elements, then you will tend to get carbide formation eventually. Um, and therefore, you wouldn't get uh, retained austenite. Okay. Uh, one more question is, uh, suppose I take a higher silicon containing uh, uh, grade and if I do an ass tempering from uh, intercritical temperature holding, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, uh, the blocking austenite whatever is forming, will it get transformed subsequently into ferrite and uh, martensite? So intercritical annealing means you produce some austenite, but yes. there's also ferrite. Yes. And then uh, you have some sort of uh, isothermal transformation to bainitic ferrite. Right? Yes. If, if you have a blocky austenite formed, uh, yeah. will it subsequently get transformed to martensite or uh, uh, or it is likely to transform to ferrite? Yeah. So so it will it 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 is straightforward to do a calculation to uh, see whether the concentration of carbon in the austenite is sufficient for it to be retained or for it to form martensite. So okay. uh, in general, um, when when you have commercial trip assisted steels, yes. they ensure that there is sufficient transformation to stop the martensite from forming. Now, there's one more thing. Um, uh, you mentioned the blocks of Osnay. The yes. blocks I was talking about are very large, you know, something like 50 micrometers in size. Uh, but you will always get some blocks. But if they are small in size, then they don't trip. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We're probably running out of uh, time now. Yeah, Seth, uh, thank you uh, very much for your uh, talk. And uh, I'm really uh, privileged that you have accepted our invitations and uh, just give us such a nice talk to and, and always to uh, hear from you, from your books, from your, uh, uh, from, from your websites, all the uh, documents available uh, regarding steel, development in steel. So it is really very, very uh, important uh, to interact with you uh, regarding development of steel. So uh, uh, once again, uh, I will thank you, sir. And uh, I will also request that once the uh, travel relaxations are relieved, uh, if any time, uh, so uh, we will be privileged to welcome you in NIT Raukella uh, in, in, in future uh, conferences. Uh, so yeah, so uh, once again, I will thank uh, uh, our, our student member, uh, Amlan Das is present, who has done all the YouTube live uh, streaming and everything, uh, our HOD. Uh, sir, all the faculty members uh, are present, were supported for organizing the event. Uh, uh, thank you very much, sir, once again for your time. Thank it's you. my pleasure, and thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye, sir.